good afternoon. I think it's loading. Good afternoon, everybody. Oh, now we're live. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining us here on the Environmental Learning Centers of Connecticut Facebook page. Uh, this program, the Winter Animal Tracking, is a part of the Connecticut DEP um, Virtual Winter Festival. So thanks for jo uh, having us join the program and for you guys coming over. Uh, today during this program, we're going to be learning some tips and tricks on how to correctly identify um, mammals when they leave footprints behind in the snow. Okay, um, so my name is Lauren Pryor. Um, I'm here at the Indian Rock Nature Preserve. Um, the other facility we have is the Barnes Nature Center. So the Barnes Nature Center building is closed right now, but the trails are open to the public. So after our program here or tomorrow when it's snowing or Monday after the snow, you can go over to the Barnes Nature Center out on the trails and use some of the tips and tricks that you learned today. Um, so before we get started, I just want to say that tracking is a very intensive skill um, and it's like learning how to read. So in this half hour, it, we're going to be doing very basic um, skills with how to do a few mammals in Connecticut. Um, so if we're thinking about learning the ABCs of tracking, we're not even going to touch upon simple sentences or paragraphs or whole books yet. We're going to be focusing just on the A of ABCs. Okay. And with our tracking, um, tracking invites you to go into the lives of animals, um, into your backyard, on your public open spaces. Um, so it, we always want to keep in mind when we're in those spaces that you are going into the animal's home, so you are a visitor. So you never really want to directly approach a wild animal. You're just using these tracking skills to look at clues um, about what that animal has been up to. Okay, so we are going to take a look at some pictures in just a moment, but to get started, let me ask you guys, what materials do you think would be a good, what materials would you think would be good to pack if you're going to go on an animal tracking expedition in the winter? Winter would be our first clue. So if you're going tracking in the winter, you always want to be wearing appropriate clothing. Um, another thing for tracking is having a reference guide. You can always bring a reference guide book, like I have one here, Stokes, Na uh, Stokes Nature Guides. Um, the Stokes Nature Guides, there's a whole bunch um, about animal behavior, tracking, and other nature topics. Um, Caroline, I see you said a magnifying glass. That would be a really good thing to bring. I, that's on my um, list in my backpack when I go tracking. So you can get up close to the details. You might also bring binoculars. You're not going to use your binoculars for the track itself, but you can use your binoculars for looking at animals from a distance or plants. Um, other things to bring, you might bring a measuring tape or a ruler. Okay, like a little six inch ruler, you might bring a whole 12 inch ruler or a measuring tape. Um, if you don't have a ruler, you might bring an object such as your sunglasses or even a quarter as an item to use for scale. So Fran, you said a camera. Um, so when you take a picture of that track, you can put your item down next to it for scale. So you want to use an object that doesn't change its size. Um, you might use a pen, but not, necess not necessarily a pencil if the pencil is going to get sharpened down. Um, I've seen people use sunglasses or their hat, an object that's not going to change its size. So when you place it down next to the track and take a picture of it and look back on it later, you can get an idea on what size it is. Um, let's see. Back to field guides for a moment. Um, some really easy user-friendly guides are the Peterson guides, um, but you do want to make sure that your guide is relevant to your area. 
So if we're here in Connecticut, you don't want to use a guide that has animals from Europe. Okay. So you've got your supplies that you want to use to begin tracking your animals. Now you're ready to go out. So where do you go? Okay, that's the next step. You've got to think, where can I go to track some animals? And again, this could be done right in your backyard, um, a public park, um, Connecticut State Forest. So the, the areas are kind of endless that you can go. But you, when you get to those areas, you want to make sure that there are animals there. So when you get to that area, you're going to be looking for and doing what's called sign tracking, where you're not looking for the track itself, you're just looking for evidence of animals. So that would include, um, you could do some landscape tracking, which is where you look for, okay, is this area gonna have the food, water, and shelter and resources for the animal to survive? Um, if you think of a deer, um, where herbivores go, carnivores will follow, so if you have um, a deer or a rabbit, well is there lots of vegetation for brush cover? Is there vegetation for food? Is there water? So you're looking for the resources for them to survive. You might also look for travel routes. A lot of the times animals will use the same travel routes that people do. It's ease, ease of access. It's the, the easiest route traveled. It's already cleared path for them. Um, so animals, you will find tracks directly on trails, next to trails, cutting across trails. Um, sometimes animals, uh, if they're being pursued by a predator, that's when they're going to be off trail, where they can quickly go under brush and get under cover. Uh, you might look for animal resting areas. So you're going to be looking for dens or cavities in trees, holes in the ground. You might look for really brushy lay areas. Um, in the snow, you might see a track pattern lead up to a, um, an area of leaves where the snow is all melted. An animal was sleeping there for the night. And then of course you have some miscellaneous signs like rubbings, if a deer's been rubbing its antlers on the bark. Um, you might have a bear um, rubbing on bark. Fran, I see you said dropping scat is a very big clue. Um, we're not going to talk really about scat at all today in this webinar. Scat is a whole other topic by itself. Uh, all scat is different based off of the animals, the food it's eating, um, when it's eating that food. Uh, Herbivore scat looks different than carnivore scat, so it's really all different shapes and sizes, but yes, you do want to look for scat. You can also look for um, hair and feathers that have been dropped, gnaw marks. If you're by a pond, you might look for gnaw marks from um, past beaver activity. Okay, so those are all signs and clues that can give us an idea that an animal is around. Okay, so you're off on the trail, you've got some a good idea that some animals are around um, in the winter time. Uh, you're walking on the trail and lo and behold you find a track and you have no idea what it is. Okay, Now winter is a great idea for learning how to track um, and beginner trackers to expand their skill set because of the snow. Uh, tracking can be done in mud and sand and dust, but um, snow is really great because you get that, that solid um, imprint um, that you can see go for a distance where if you're tracking in the mud, once you move from mud to grass, the track is a little bit harder to follow. Um, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to start to share my screen. We're going to look at some pictures. First I want us to take a look at some parts of the track before we start to learn our tips and tricks on how to look at common Connecticut mammals. All right. So hang on one second as I start to share my screen.
It seems like Facebook's giving me a little error about the screen sharing, but that's why it's always handy to have your reference book so we can use our reference book for our tracking pictures. Okay. So with our parts of a track, let me find a picture here. With our parts of a track, we're looking at some four-toed tracks in the canine family. So with our track, some simple parts of the track, we've got our toes, okay? You can see claw marks. Claw marks may or may not be visible. And then we've got the heel pad. And the heel pad and the claws are gonna be two big clues that we're gonna be paying attention to as we ID these animals, especially with the heel pad and the number of lobes that they have. So lobes are kind of these points of the heel pad, okay? We've got the outer toes, the inner toes, the inner track, and the outer track. Okay. So with our tracks, we're gonna first talk about the ungulate family. Okay, does anyone, is anyone familiar with that word and who might belong to that group of animals? The ungulates. Domestic ungulates you might find on a farm but we do have a wild one here in Connecticut. They're often in forests um, and fields. Caroline, good guess, uh, but wolves is not uh, accurate here. Um, Tests, yes, hoofed animals like deer. So in Connecticut, we have the white-tailed deer. Okay, that's a moose track. Our, the big one's a moose track. We'll look at the small one, our deer track. So our deer track, okay, ungulates have, are they're hoofed and they have two toes. Okay, so we've got two toes here. Um, they can vary in size depending on the age of the animal. So if they're younger, um, they could be as small as an inch and a half, going up to four inches. Um, but one thing to look for, um, some tricks when you're looking at a deer, um, we've got kind of this lobey heart shape of a track. So we've got two toes, we've got a, a kind of rounded heart shape Deer a lot are going to be in a high vegetation area because they're big browsers. You might see them or not see them um, in big hemlock groves where they can easily see you going out, but it's going to be hard to see them going into the grove. Okay, they're camouflaging in there. But a tip is that the top of the track is always pointed and it's pointing in that direction. Okay. Now let's think about the canine family. What animals in Connecticut would be a part of the canine family? And as Caroline was mentioning wolves, we do not have wolves in Connecticut, so we can cross that off the list. What canines do we have here in Connecticut? Francis Coyote, yes, Coyote, definitely. We have foxes. We have the red and the gray fox. And then our domestic dogs. We take our dogs out for walks in the park. Okay, so canine families. Okay, we're back to our our canine page. Okay. Uh, Canines 
we can kind of take a look at um, the shape of the tract is always kind of an oval shape, an oval shape. Okay, so when we're looking at tracks, there's really four questions you want to be asking yourself. Okay, what is the overall shape of the track? How many toes are there? Are there claws? And what is the size? So our shape, we've got an oval. We see four toes. There's four toes on, uh, we've got a dog track down here, a coyote and a fox. Four toes on each. Canines have four toes. Okay, are there claws? Yes, we see nail indents. Okay, uh, as far as size, it is going to be relative to the age and what species it is. So your foxes are going to be smaller than your coyotes, um, but your dog track can really vary depending on what breed of dog you have. So if you're out in the woods and you're thinking, well, is this a dog? or a fox or a coyote, and if it's a coyote or fox, and what breed of dog is it? Because they all kind of look the same, they all have four toes, claws, they're all over sh oval shaped. The next thing you're gonna look at is the track pattern. So how the tracks are laid, because when a dog goes for a walk, like when I take my dog for a walk in the woods, he's all over the place. He's on the left sniffing some branches, he's on the right sniffing some leaves, he runs up ahead, then he looks back and runs back to me. He's all over the place. He's got a really sloppy trail. Okay. Coyotes and foxes don't have the extra energy to be carelessly exploring like that. They, they have a goal, a purpose. They're either going to rest, they're going to find their resources, their food or water. They're very goal oriented, so their tracks are gonna be very deliberate. A lot of times coyotes and foxes, they're gonna um, have direct um, footprints. So their kind of, their back feet and their, their front feet are gonna be over um, lapping with each other, okay? A good way to memorize if you're a, a trick to if you're looking at a canine track compared to say a feline track is if you're thinking well D for dog canines okay D is the fourth letter of the alphabet you've got fourth letter you've got four toes with claw marks okay we can also look at the heel pad Okay, so the heel pad here. When we have a canine, we always have a one to two ratio of the lobes. So we have a one lobe up here and then two lobes. Okay, we have a one to two lobe ratio on the heel pad. Okay. Up next, we're going to talk about the feline family. So in Connecticut, who's going to be in the feline family? In Connecticut, we're thinking Connecticut, so we're not, we don't have tigers and jaguars. Who's our, who are our cats in Connecticut? It could be as simple as a cat. Lori's saying bobcats. Thank you. Fran's saying bobcats. Yeah. So it could be a house cat. That's outside a feral cat, um, Stacy up domestic cats, or bob cats. Okay, so on our reference guide, I'm going to cover the top because that's not relevant to what we're talking about right now. But the bottom here, we have a bob cat and a house cat. So with our cats, okay, we're going to be thinking what is the shape? Remember, we have four questions what is the shape? What is the size? How many toes? And if there are claws. So with our bobcat or our wild cats, it's much, much more circular in shape, much more circular. Okay, remember our canines are more oval. With our bobcats, we have four toes, but you'll notice there are no claw marks. Okay, unlike our canines, if you have a house cat, you might be familiar that cats retract their claws up into their paws. So same with bobcats. So when they're walking in the snow, we do not see any claw marks. Okay. 
Another good uh, trick to look at if you're looking at a bobcat track compared to a canine track is our lobe ratio. So with our bobcat here, we see two lobes on top to three lobes on the bottom. Okay, you can think of it as an M shape. And of course, our cat, our house cat is almost half the size as our bobcat. Okay, so with our tracks, um, those are some tips and tricks about really common animals that you're going to be seeing here in Connecticut out in the snow. Still active during the winter, foxes, coyotes, bobcats, feral cats, house cats in the area. Um, one other track that's really, really common are squirrel and rabbit tracks. Okay, so with our squirrels and rabbits, squirrels are up in the trees. So a lot of times they're going to be landing, they're, they're gallopers. Rabbits and squirrels are considered gallopers. So when they land, their two larger back feet are landing in front of their smaller front feet. Okay. So when you're looking for a squirrel and a rabbit, you're going to think, well, where does the track start? Okay, if it begins and ends at a tree, you're going to be thinking a squirrel. Okay, if it doesn't, if it goes down into a burrow, maybe a hole in the ground, you're going to be thinking rabbit. Okay, let's see. We also have other track patterns, so if you don't have a clear track to look at, like if you're thinking in your tree, if you're looking in your reference book, if you don't have a track to look at, you can also look at the track pattern. So if the track itself is unclear, but you see a bunch of tracks, you're going to be thinking, how is that animal moving? So in our reference book, when we think of squirrels and rabbits, Okay. On the top, we have a rabbit, and on the bottom, we have a squirrel. So when a squirrel is jumping, the larger circles are their back feet landing in front of the smaller front feet. Squirrel front feet are kind of side by side, rabbit front feet will kind of be off centered from each other. Okay. Track patterns, sometimes the tracks, they'll overlap with each other, so foxes, coyotes, bobcats, they'll kind of, their front feet and back feet will overlap with each other, where if you're thinking of a deer, you're going to see kind of these four hooves marks as you can go forward, okay? Here are some other pictures of examples of patterns and different gates. You might also see tail drags in the snow. So when you're thinking of an animal, you might see footprints, but you also might see tail drags. So a lot of mice will do this. Possums will do this. Okay. Uh, shrews will do this. So if you see footprints, but also lines through the snow, you will see evidence of those animals. Okay. So that we can look up other pictures, but does anyone have any questions so far? See, are you saying droppings? Yes. So scat, we can pull up a few pictures of scat in our reference book. 
Scat is a really big evidence. Um, scientists love to see scat. Uh, don't ever touch scat with your hands, but you can use sticks out on the trail or you can bring the tweezers and um, prodding tools with you on your trail walks to kind of break apart scat to see what that animal is eating. A lot of times if you have a small herbivore like a, a, a rabbit, you're going to have really kind of small round droppings. Um, deer too, where if you get to carnivores, you're going to see a more tubular scat, um, sometimes with hair and bones. We're talking a lot about mammals, but birds are active during the winter too, so a lot of birds are toughing it out. So we have turkey that are still active in the winter time. Um, you might see hawks, you can see wing tip marks in the snow, okay, or you can see owl pellets. Um, if you've ever kind of dissected an owl pellet in school, you can kind of reconstruct the skeleton. Yeah, you can break apart scat right there on the trail. Um, what animals are eating can change depending on the time of year. So something like a fox in the springtime is going to be eating a lot of um, berries. They might be eating some plant matter. Um, where in the wintertime they're going to be relying more on those small mammals. So what their scat looks like can greatly vary depending on the time of year. We can also kind of determine if an animal is healthy or not, depending on its scat. Carolyn's asking if we have a lot of turkey in this area. We do have plenty of turkey here on the um, Indian Rock Nature Preserve. We have wild turkey as well as some education turkey, some domestic turkey on our Indian Rock farm. Um, but we can see bird um, footprints are different than mammals as they tend to have those long toes. Um, and you can have a toe that has like three toes forward. If you are looking for something like a woodpecker, their foot looks more like an X. But turkeys, you'll see those three toes going forward on the ground. They're really messy eaters, so they might shuffle up the snow a lot as they're kind of browsing for food. Do we have any other questions on our foxes, coyotes, bobcat footprints, or other evidence of animals out there in the wild? Uh, the book I have um, is a book, in the reference book I have with me today um, is just with mammals. Um, but there are loads of resources online that you can use. There are free resources. You don't have to pay for tracking resources. Um, you can look up plenty of pictures. You can go to your local library and take out a book. Um, or, of course, you can purchase one to have your own copy forever. Um, but like I said, you just want to make sure your guidebook is relevant to your area. So it's showing you the natural wildlife in your area. A lot of books have the prints, what their scat looks like, a picture of the animal, they have a lot of natural history, or they can be very, very beginner, basic, just a picture of the print and animal. Do we have any final questions? Yes, Lisa. So it is a very controversial topic um, on people who think there are mountain lions in the state and people who do not think mountain lions are in the state. Um, but if you were to find or try to go looking for a mountain lion track out in the snow, it would be much like that bobcat print. Um, so remember, you've got four questions to ask yourself. The shape the size, how many toes, and if there are claws. So if we go back to our bobcat, I don't believe we have a mountain lion picture in this book. It's going to be bigger than the bobcat. Mountain lions are bigger than bobcats. 
you're looking for four toes with no claw marks, and then of course the two to three lobes. And yes, Jay, we will get this live event to be posted to view later. Um, I did have some slides to show you with some pictures. Facebook, unfortunately, was giving me an error with the screen sharing, so I will post the pictures when we post the event later so everyone can take a look at those as well. So we are just about to wrap up here with our virtual winter tracking program. So with those tips and tricks, remember you've got four questions to ask yourself. What is the shape of the print? What is the size of the print? How many toes are there and are there claws or not? Those are four really simple questions that you can ask yourself when you're going out on your trail walk and you see a track. Bring a reference book, okay? It's always good to have a guide. Uh, we'd love to see any pictures, so if you take pictures out on the trail and you find something that want us to, and you need help IDing it or you just want to share it, you can always send it to us in a Facebook message. But thanks for joining us today, and remember to head back to the Connecticut DEP Facebook page for the next Winter Festival program.